I'm not going to go very dark in the sky because it's, um, well, this is pretty dark, but I'll get it covered up. It's a, a very cloudy, uh, mucky day that this picture was taken. The picture I'm working for, I'll show it to you later. Um, and in the end, I'll probably add some greens to the sky also because of the... Um, I like to add, I like to put all the colors that I use in the painting everywhere in the painting to give it some, uh, it makes the picture look, it makes the picture hang together. If you add, if you have all your greens and your browns and your yellows all down here and all your blues and your cool colors up here, then the picture doesn't hang together. It looks like two separate paintings. So you have to have all your colors everywhere, everywhere in the painting. You can't, you can't isolate sections of color um, to one section of the painting. It just, this doesn't work. It doesn't hang together well unless you have all the colors in the painting everywhere in the painting. So this is a really snowy, um, solid, solidly, clouded sky. There's not much variation in it, it so it looks cold and, and cloudy and, and solidly clouded. It, it, there's not much cloud shape in the sky, just a little bit of variation. I'm gonna, I'll go over these trees and then put them back in, but I know they're there. I'm scumbling. This is called scumbling. When you use the, the flat side of your pastel and you just cover ground, that's called scumbling. And I'm just putting on the first coat. I'll come back and work into this several times during the painting. A watercolorist, Clyde Stout, told me one time that to make your sky look less one-dimensional, if one side is just a little darker than the other, then generally a little bit darker than the other, say this this side of the sky is a little darker than the other, then your, your picture will have a little more depth. So I want, in general, I want this side of the sky to be a little bit darker than that side so that my painting won't look one-dimensional. So I've picked up kind of a, a dull purple gray here that I'm adding in. Because I don't want the, the sky to be completely one color. And here's the kind of pink color I'm gonna use to blend. I don't know, but when I'm out under, I don't know, I grew up in North Carolina. This is actually a picture that I took at Yellowstone, but when I was in North Carolina, every time the sky, it snowed, the sky looked a little pink to me, a little pink in it. I don't know what that was about, but it looked a little pinky all the time. Maybe it was just the industrial pollution in the, in the uh, city that produced a lot of textiles, I don't know. This is a, a new pastel, a new, as in, not new pastels, in, as in new, N-U-P-A-S-T-E-L as a brand, but as in it is brand new. <laughs> it's a uniform pastel that's new, but I'm gonna break it in half 
and take and not use it with the paper on it because I I do not like the you can't scumble well with the paper on it. So I'm gonna add some pink. See I want all these colors to kind of show through each other. This one also is also moving. I don't I don't want to use it with the Color and color. I hear a, cl cr a, a kitty crying in the background back there. I don't know what that particular cat in my house wants. Okay, so I'm going to leave it like that for now. Um, so then I want to go to these hills here. This one happens to be covered in, in, in green trees and they are evergreens and they have tiny little bits of snow on them. This is the picture I'm working from. Um, you can see it's a little bit different and there is a little bit of cloud variation but not much. Um, and the hill is completely filled with trees and a tiny little bit of powdering of snow. I had to adapt a little bit because that one tree is right in the middle of the picture and I'm gonna um, amp up the uh, reds and yellows along the side of the, the river. And I've placed some trees. I'm, I'm taking a lot of artistic license with the placement of the trees and things just to uh, emphasize the things that I really like about the picture. Anyway, that's what I'm working from. I think I went off. They, they go straight up, and I think I went off probably to I need to make these straighter up, don't I? Just, uh, I think I make a, made them look like they're going sideways, didn't I? Let me look from here. 
trees don't curve around like that. That's a little better. I don't want the foreground to be overwhelmed by this. And this needs to fade together and not, not um, be a prominent part of the painting, really. So, or what I could do is kind of scumble in with this, make some dark patches. I don't want to cover up any more my white than I have. So I have to be careful and put the dark patches over the already green patches that I have in there. And then I'll show you what I'm going to do with these darker patches. I think they're darker. I'm not sure they're darker. Let me make sure of that. They're a tiny bit darker, not much darker. Let's see if this is any darker than that. Yeah, this is darker. This is much darker. Okay, so let me scumble in here with this. Just a shade darker. Mm, I don't want it too much darker because if I put too much contrast in here, this will take over the, the painting, which I don't want it to do. I'll go in here with this. Now, what I want to do also is I'm going to try to, I'm going to probably use some of these blue greens in there. Use some of that blue green back here. Scumble some of it in. Maybe even sideways. Because what I want to do is go back in with my original green and make the little trees with it. I'm going to see through the shadows. I don't want to get too much of that white covered up because I really want it to be the snow on the hill. I want it to be the patches of snow on the hill. I don't want to cover up any more of that white. Stepping away from your painting is so important. It's like one of the most important things you can do when you're painting is, is walk, is take a step back and look at what you're doing. It's like, you know, gold. All right, so now I'm gonna go back in with my original, original little, the little, the, the pastel I used before that was the one that I, that's homemade, that I made from the dust of my old, of my painting I had. And that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna put the little trees in with. Okay, so go through and I'm gonna put in all these little trees. And that's gonna take a long time. So I'm gonna stop this thing so that you don't have to watch me put in all those little tiny marks and I will turn it back on when I'm finished. There are these white snow fields here. I've made them a little bigger on my picture, but I need to get them in. Um, the light in my, my, my studio is, I think I need to get those in. And, and they're disrupted by a few larger trees. So I'll get those in, and those trees have some snow dotted on them that you may be able to see a little bit. We'll see how that goes when I paint.
Okay, from the other side of the room, I can see that this needs to be flattened out for sure. This one is sticking out into the, the river about right. I don't know what this one needs to do, so I need to go check my reference photo. Okay, my reference photo tells me that this needs to, this one's sticking out about right. But this one needs to come back at an angle like this. And it's gonna be covered with these, these shrubberies and things, so it doesn't matter that it smears into this other color. That's just not a matter. That just, just doesn't matter. And it arches up into this from here. And these two guys are not realistic yet. And uh, I put their trunks in, but since there are gonna be some big trees in here, they're probably gonna get co covered up anyway. But I did want to show to you that when you start to bring these evergreens forward, you do need to start putting in their trunks. And they also need to start to look more like real trees. So you have to draw them more botanically correct. Even though you may not be a botanist, you are an artist and you can observe them and you do get, whether you know it or not, you become more botanically correct. All right, I'm gonna stop for now because look at my hands, I need to wash them. I've got gloves in a bottle on them, but I don't use gloves and finger cots like a lot of other artists do, and my, my hands get so dirty that I need to wash them periodically. I just mentioned gloves in a bottle, which I put on my hands. I don't know that I mentioned it before. Um, a bottle like this goes, lasts for a long, long time. Long, long, long time. I've put in the sky, I've put in the background, I've put in a few trees on these uh, snowy hills. I think it's time to put in the river now. And the river is not blue. Um, it is water. Uh, it is flowing, but it is not blue. So, um, It, it does reflect the sky a bit, as you can see in this, uh, but it, it's mostly the color of the earth and the rocks underneath it. It has a little bit of reflectivity of the sky, but not a lot, because it's moving and it's cold and it's a, a shallow. So um, it won't be so much the color of the sky as it is the things around it the trees and the vegetation around it.
I didn't need that much brown in those. Where's my brush?
I um, decided to make the tree more full so that the snow would show up against the leaves of the, the needles of the tree itself. I, um, I thought about that when I went to wash my hands. I took the little annoying grasses out from in front of here because it was too busy. You don't need busyness in your foreground. You need uh, calmness because you don't want to distract that. I took a lot of the little grasses out of here because I decided this needed to be a place for the eye to rest. I made the, this annoys me, it's like melting ice cream, but I'll fix that later. Um, I made the highlight, the snow, uh, bring this tree out from against the background. I uh, went in and I made the snow at the top of this tree brighter than the snow at the bottom. Because I don't want my, the eyes to go down here. I brightened the snow at the top of this tree. I added some red, which you can barely see, to the, because there are reds or yellows down here, I added some red to the sky. You can barely tell it, um, but it will help to unify the painting. I thought that since I had all my pastel stuff out, I would show you how to reconstitute a broken pastel. I, I drop mine all the time and I break them. I have a hardwood floor in my studio. These are little chips that I've saved. I, they keep sliding so you can't see them, but here are some blue ones, um, purple, blue, blue. <laughs> um, I save them in baby food jars. I grind them up with a mortar and pestle so that they're all very uh, fine and they will mix together very well. Um, if I, I, I try to save the uh, similar colors together. You don't always have enough to make a nice big pastel, but if you save two or three that you break, you'll, unless you break brand new one, and then you can, then you'll have a nice, you can make a nice new big one, sadly. But um, uh, I also, when I uh, erase, if I have erased enough pastel off, I will take my little tray that I've made out of aluminum foil and pour that into a, um, into a, a jar and save that and reconstitute pastel because often I'll be erasing a sky or something and I'll have a lot of blue in it and it'll be a nice blue color that I can make a blue pastel out of. And anybody who works with pastels know they're very expensive. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, reconstitute this chartreuse color for you. One of the things I do is sometimes is I squirt, as I squirt the water into the, um, onto the edge of the, I don't squirt directly in here because if you do that, then you get a, a cloud of pastel dust and it, it will, you don't want to breathe it. Past, breathing pastel dust is not a good thing. So I squirt it onto the side of the jar like you were taught to pour beer onto the side so it wouldn't make a, a foamy head when you were, I don't know, we were taught that. That's what, how people taught me to pour beer when I was a kid. I can't drink it anymore because I'm gluten intolerant anyway. Um, so, I'm going to stir it all up. One of the reasons that you want to grind up the chunks is because you don't want chunks of different shades of the pastel or to, to be in your stick that you've reconstituted because you'll get, when you gumble with it, you'll get stripes of different colors or different shades of green or purple or whatever you're reconstituting. So you want them all to be crunched up and mixed up evenly together. Um, it'll be that effect you had when you had those multicolored pens when you were a kid that had multiple styluses in them and you could draw rainbows and stuff. Um, though I've had a couple of, of a couple of uh, pastels that turned out that way that I used to a really good effect. <laughs> Uh, they come in handy sometimes. Once the pastel is wet, you can squirt right down in there. I I just don't like to get I don't like to get too much water in here because it takes forever for them to dry. Um, but you want enough water that you can pour it out without too much trouble. I'm just mixing with a back end of a paintbrush. You can mix with whatever you want. If you have a little spatula, that's great. All of our little spatulas are occupied with uh, dishing out cat food. I do occasionally get a piece of cat fur in here, and, but that's okay. 
these these molds. I don't remember whether I said these are are not pastel molds. They're things I found at Target on sale. I believe they're some kind of candy mold or something like that. They were just on sale at Target, and I thought, oh, those would make great pastel sticks, so I got them. They're on one of those reduced in clearancing cups. So now y'all just pour them in here. They'll get a little smaller because the water evaporates, but there's no... Since you're not going to bake them, they're not going to rise or anything like that. There's no baking powder in them. You don't have to fill them half full. You can fill them all the way up. Now, I've got a lot of pastel still in there. It's not coming out very well. That's when I wish I had a tiny, tiny spatula. And maybe it would be that better to have it in some kind of sort of mixing bowl. I'll add a little more water. Get a little bit more of it out. I put the paintbrush end in there, but mostly what I find when I put the paintbrush in there is I just end up, you know, the paintbrush sucks it up and I don't get much more of it. It all goes into the paintbrush and I don't get it into the mold anyway. So I can keep adding a little more and a little more water to wash a little bit more of it out. Let it settle on top. Hope it will glue itself down. In. And as I said, you don't need to add any um, I don't know whether I said this or not, but you, you don't need to add any kind of uh, binding binder in here because it's it's in the original pastels, right? The binder was already in there. And those pastels that you broke or that you used up on your painting, you don't need to add any binder. It's already in there. Pastels, really good pastels, are mostly pure pig pigment. That's why you don't call them chalk. Chalk is is mostly binder and a very little bit little bit of pigment. Pastels are mostly pigment and very little binder. They have just enough to hold the pigment together. Um, in fact, I believe they have less binder than paint does. So you do get your hands a little messy, but. Or I do. You don't have to. <laughs> Sorry, that's in the way. But that's that's what ha you end up with is this little, um, a little. I used to use just plain old. Um, if you don't have one of these, I used to just make my little molds out of uh, aluminum foil works. Anything works. Uh, and that's how you reconstitute a pastel. It's very easy.